it is a wonderful thing to be uh, here with you this evening and uh, to hear the singing, especially the choir. And uh, your singing is one of the things that I always look forward to whenever we come here. And uh, how I wish we can sing as beautifully as you and how we wish that uh, we can sing with notes. Um, there was one who said, uh, I cannot read that notes, there's too many. And in the Philippines, back home, uh, we don't sing with notes. Uh, we sing with a tune, the rhythm. We don't read notes. We cannot do that. And uh, that is also the same with driving there. We don't read traffic signs. We cannot do that. <laughs> uh, Brother Skip Holland was with me one time years ago. And I asked him to drive my truck. And he said, I cannot do that. I said, why? Because there are no traffic signs, there are no lines. I said, well, I cannot drive your truck in the States for the same reason. He said, why? Because there are too many lines and many, many signs. And he said, how can you drive when there is no line in the middle of the road? I said, you imagine the line. And so, same with singing, we imagine the notes. But yes, uh, we are so grateful. Uh, that the Lord enabled me and Neil to come. Um, my wife was not able to get travel authority from the government, and so uh, she was not able to come. She is busy with her research project for her master's degree, and also with uh, teaching at the uh, high school in Calatrava. But uh, we will try next year for her to be able to get travel authority. As uh, most of you have heard, Government employees in the Philippines are not allowed to travel abroad without getting a special permit from the government. And that kind of permit is given only by the highest authorities there. Like Lynn, she needs to get a permit from the Secretary of Education herself in Manila. And that takes a long time. But uh, please pray for her. Um, it's been our third week here. We are so grateful for our gracious host, the Hadnals, Brother Tommy and uh, Sister Jane. I realized this morning whenever I was uh, uh, d preparing for church that I've gained a pound or two since coming here. And I blame the potatoes and, uh, of course, all the food that uh, we ate. And uh, I hope I can lose weight whenever I come home because uh, I don't want people there wondering what happened to me here. <laughs> um, if you have your Bibles with you, please open the First Corinthians chapter 15, the 15th chapter of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. First letter to the Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 15. I'll read verse 58. You might have uh, read the whole chapter today, or you might have heard this chapter preached this morning. And by the way, we truly enjoyed and were blessed by the sunrise service we had at Serenity Church this morning. Uh, of course, it was very freezing for us, but uh, that is fine. I uh, have preached sweating back home, so it's a small thing to be able to hear the Word of God shivering because of cold. It's, it's not really a great sacrifice. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, the Word of God says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the topic of this chapter. And Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote one of the most thorough and one of the most shall we say, detailed explanation of the resurrection of the dead. And this came about because the Corinthians were Greeks, and they were immersed in Greek philosophy. And uh, as we know, in the Greek mindset, there is no such thing as resurrection. In fact, the Greeks were the ones who thought of the atoms. Uh, they thought that everything is made up of atoms, and when we die... Our bodies dissolved and came to nothingness. 
and all the bonds that make these atoms, you know, compose our body is destroyed and there's nothing there. So for the Greeks, the resurrection is foolishness. It is foreign to their minds. And so we, cannot, uh, we can assume that some of the people here in Corinth who came from this kind of philosophies have started to question the reality of the resurrection of the dead. And so Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote this beautiful chapter. And in this chapter, we learn, first of all, that the resurrection of the dead is very important. Because he said in uh, verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the assurance that someday we will be resurrected. It is the assurance that the, op the, the, the graves will be opened and His people will rise in glorified body. That is the hope and assurance of the Christian. And that is the reason why Paul emphasized that in the gospel, it's cornerstone is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No resurrection of the Lord means no resurrection of His disciples. It's connected. The assurance of our resurrection is connected and founded upon the resurrection of our Lord. And Paul in this chapter tells us that the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the first day of the week is a fact in history. It is not a myth. It is not a made-up made lie. It is not a fable. It is a fact in history. It happened. It's real. And Paul challenged his readers to ask those who saw the Lord after He was risen. In verse 6, he says, After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. Now, Paul was a doctor of the law. He was trained by the Pharisees to use reasoning and logic and weigh the evidence. And you can see here that Paul challenged his readers, especially those who are in Corinth, who questioned the resurrection, to, to weigh the evidence for the resurrection of Christ. He was challenging them, them to, to, to ask those who have seen the Lord after He was risen. More, there were more than 500 of them. And he said, of whom... In verse 6, the greater part remain unto this present, but some are falling asleep. I would like to say this with a grateful heart. Our faith is not a blind faith. Christ biblical Christianity is not based on lies and assumptions and made-up fables. Our faith is not a blind faith. Our faith is based on facts. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is something that is a settled fact in history. Now, of course, we came across critics. I was reading uh, Fox News. There was an article there about the resurrection, and I read all the comments, and there were so many there that questioned it. Someone said, it's a myth. It's made up lie. It's a fable. It is uh, something that was made up by the apostles so that they can proclaim a new religion. Well, Paul was a Jew. He was a Pharisee. He was a doctor of the law. He was trained in logic. He was trained in reasoning. And you can see the wonderful chains, the radical chains that happened to him whenever he was on his way to Damascus. Now, can you explain that chains if Jesus Christ was indeed not risen from the dead? Can you explain that chains if it is a lie that the resurrection did not happen? I don't think so. Paul was a persecutor, and now he was the persecuted. Paul lost everything whenever he got converted. He lost his position in the Sanhedrin. He lost his power, his, his wealth, his influence. He lost many friends. Now, can you explain that? If the Lord is not resurrected, if Paul was not convinced that Jesus was indeed risen from the dead, 
I cannot think of any other explanation. The proclamation of the resurrection was done in the very place that our Lord was crucified, in Jerusalem. And anybody with an honest mind and an open mind and an open heart can check if this story is true. But all we can read from the scriptures is that what the Jewish authorities did was to warn under threat of harm and, and death the apostles and the disciples not to mention the name of Jesus, not to preach about Jesus rising from the dead. You know, when, when people try to uh, kill the messenger, it only means one thing. They cannot refute the message. When, when people try to uh, extinguish the message, it is because they cannot unprove it. And that's happened with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you are here tonight and you are doubting about this fact, all you have to do is read the accounts of the Gospels. All you have to do is explain, uh, read the writings of the Apostles. All you have to do is check what Paul has said about it and you will be convinced that the resurrection indeed is true. It is not a lie. It is not a myth. It is something that happened in history. Now, academies, academicians, people who went to universities, philosophers, literature fanatics will tell you about Plato or Aristotle or Herodotus. But if you will care to check, we have more evidence about Jesus Christ rising from the dead than about Plato writing about something or about Herodotus writing about something because all of their writings are just copies and copies and copies and copies. And yet, these men who criticize the resurrection and doubt the, the, our Lord Jesus Christ as a Messiah are so proud to say, ah, we believe in Plato, we believe in Herodotus, we believe in Aristotle. And yet, if you will care to check the evidence, they will pale in comparison to the evidence about the resurrection. So the resurrection is real. It happened in history. But it is not enough that we know that it happened. It is not enough that we agree that it is real. We must ask ourselves, is Jesus living in us? Have we received him as our Savior? You see, his resurrection, as I've said a while ago, is the cornerstone of the gospel. And we who have believed the gospel are assured that we, we believe the truth. And because we believe the truth, then our faith is not in vain. And because Jesus was risen from the dead, then our preaching is not in vain. And most of all, our living for him is not in vain. That's why Paul said in the last chapter, as a conclusion to this treatise, he said, therefore, you know, therefore means in consideration of these things, knowing that Jesus was risen from the dead, knowing that his resurrection was real, knowing that our faith in him is not in vain, knowing that our preaching is not in vain, knowing that our sacrifices are not in vain. Therefore, he said, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. This steadfastness has something to do with our faith in the Lord. And he said, unmovable. This unmovableness has something to do with our teaching of sound doctrine. And he said, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, the word always abounding in the Greek, it means to be above the ordinary. How is our service in the Lord? We who have been washed clean by His blood, we who have been saved by His grace, we who are the temple of the Holy Spirit, how, 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 how are we serving Him? Are we serving Him above the ordinary? Or we are just giving Him our excess, our excess time, our excess money, our excess energy. Paul said, since the resurrection is true, then you have to understand and realize that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. You see, uh, you read of those missionaries, especially those who went to the foreign countries. I love reading 
biographies of these missionaries. I, I've read about Adoniram Judson. The other day, we went to William Carey University. We went to this small museum about that great missionary. We learned many things about his life. He was a great man of God. I've read about David Brainerd, that great missionary to the Indians. I've read about the four missionaries who went to the Auka Indians in Ecuador, led by Nate Saint and Jim Elliot. They sacrificed their lives to the Lord. Why? Because they believe that their sacrifice is not in vain. They believe that their labors in the Lord is not in vain. Why? Because they believe that Jesus was indeed risen from the dead. And that is something that should encourage us and, you know, make us bold to proclaim the gospel no matter what. Why are these men willing to die for God? Because they know that Jesus was risen from the dead and one day they will be resurrected by His power. We are so distracted with so many things in this life. And sometimes we fail to realize that we are just passing here and we are just temporary here. We think that 50 years is long. But with that 50 years is finished, it's just but yesterday. And who and oh how busy we are with the things that will not matter in 100 years. How busy we are with things that will not matter before God. How busy we are with things that has no bearing with eternity. If we only realize that Jesus is alive in us, as Paul said, it is but an easy thing to live for Him. It is but an easy thing to sacrifice for Him. It is but an easy thing to give our lives for Him because we know that our labor is not in vain in Him. It is my prayer, my friends, this evening that as we meditate upon that wonderful truth of His resurrection, we will be encouraged to serve more, to do things beyond the ordinary, to, to, to give our best to the Lord, to, to serve Him with all our might, with all our heart, to love Him with all our soul and mind and heart, and, and, and to put our lives in His disposal. You know, there are so many things that need to be done in the Lord's work, and God needs laborers in His harvest. God might be calling you. Don't resist. Don't be a Jonah. Well, I was a Jonah once. And I tried to get away from God and tried to do exactly the opposite of what God wants me to do. But you cannot escape from God. That conviction in your heart, God is calling you to preach or God is calling you to be a Sunday school teacher or God is calling you to be somebody who can tell others about Him. Do not struggle. Just surrender yourself to the Lord because your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, Christians are being killed as we speak. Only the Lord knows how many Christians are being killed, tortured, imprisoned, and persecuted in other parts of the world as we sing in our churches. A couple of years ago, I came across this article in the, news, in the internet about these people. Um, they, they are Christians somewhere in the Middle East, and they were in cages. If I remember it right, there were just... There were six of them, all men. They were put in a cage by Muslim extremists. And they are being thrown into the sea in that cage. Now, I, I try to put myself in their place. What will I feel if I am one of those who were in that cage? How... how Will I meet death in the hands of those evil people? There was a video on that in YouTube. I saw it. These men were singing as they were thrown into the sea until they could not sing, until they could sing no more. And they all died. You see, persecution is sometimes a blessing. 
because there are people that may hear us may, may hear us preach or may hear us tell them about the Lord and yet they are waiting for something in our life to prove that what that we believe what we preach and sometimes persecution brings the best in us and of course sometimes the worst in us but if you are a child of God a saved born again Christian I believe that God will give you the grace to face persecution with peace and joy knowing that death has no power anymore in, up on us knowing that death is just an open door to another life with God knowing that if we are absent from this body we will be present with the Lord do you have that assurance tonight I hope you have but if you are here if you are here and have not possessed that assurance I will tell you this all you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as simple as that you know people back home during the Holy Week especially last Good Friday I've seen videos of some men getting crucified and some been flogging themselves while walking under the hot sun. Why? Because, why? because they believe that by doing that, by hurting themselves or by having themselves crucified, they will be forgiven of their sins. That is blasphemy. That is a mockery of the real sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross. There is no need for us to do that ourselves. Because what Christ did on the cross is sufficient for the salvation of all people and is sufficient for the forgiveness of all our sins. All you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. As we sing a verse of the song this evening, if whatever is in your heart, you can come and I can pray for you.